Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Cremando for Yoga You Online, and I'm here with Jessica Rial and Patricia Schmidt. Jessica is a physical therapist who specializes in working with people with pelvic floor issues. She's a board certified specialist in pelvic and women's health. She's on the faculty of the highly regarded Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehabilitation Institute, and she has a private practice. Patricia is an experienced yoga teacher with uh, a specialty also in pelvic health and many uh, studies that she's done in the areas of therapeutic yoga, including in addition to pelvic health, prenatal yoga, adaptive yoga, yoga for hypermobility, yoga for cancer survivors, lots of other things. What's really exciting about their work is that they've been collaborating for the past several years to the great benefit of their clients who can benefit from traditional physical therapy applications, but also in addition of uh, yoga practices interwoven into their uh, protocol for healing. And uh, so it's, I first want to say welcome Thank and you. then I want to say that in my opinion, my humble opinion, this is such an interesting and useful collaboration to have the yoga teacher become part of a medical, a more traditional team. So can we just start, can you just lead us off on a, this journey of how you ended up collaborating and what that's been like for you? Absolutely. Um... Thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, Patty and I have been working together for several years and uh, you know, from my own background, and I'm always very clear that I am not a yoga teacher, I'm a yoga student. And I've always loved yoga in my own personal practice and in becoming a physical therapist and then specializing in pelvic health, it seemed like a lot of the postures and what I learned in my yoga practice tended to apply a lot to my patients. And um, I, I love the way that yoga philosophy views the body. And um, I love the movements within yoga that often are very tied into the breath, to the nervous system. And so it was a really natural pairing with what I would do with my patients. And I found, you know, for me, I'm working with my patients. They might be seeing me once a week in the office. And we have a lot of different things that we're doing, you know, to where I'm working with them to help from a manual therapy standpoint, improving their soft tissue mobility, helping with spinal mobility, and helping them with their daily activities with things like um, strategies for lifting a child or how they're sitting at their desk and what they're doing with this and, and just helping them optimize those pieces. Um, but I also want to just help them more globally with their movement and really how their pelvic floor is fitting in with their body. Mm -hmm. And we do that through some prescriptive exercise. Um, but, but my ultimate goal is for them to find a practice that is really long-term for them that works with them. And that's where yoga fits in so nicely. Um, so when I think Patty, you moved here to Atlanta, was it four years ago? Yeah, like three okay. years ago. But I, I mean, I had read your blog before I moved here. Yeah, but when we, when we connected and she moved here, I was so excited to have someone who has so much training and knowledge. And, um, and I think, you know, and, and she had been working with physical therapists a lot previously. Um, and I had worked with some other instructors in the past, but, but we just have found, and I have found in my practice that it has been such a nice blend to where I'll have some patients that might be doing well and they're making some progress, but it ends up being an additional thing that helps them to feel better faster and, um, and, and create some longevity for them so that they are able to integrate this and it becomes part of who they are in their life. And it's been really positive on so many levels for them, not just their pelvic floor, um, as of course you all know. So um, I don't know if you have some other, other thoughts on our, our journey together, Patty. <laughs> I mean, I think it's like uh, Jessica has this wonderful blog. And so I think that um, I had been reading her work before I moved to Atlanta, reached out to her as one of my first points of contact as I started to uh, take my practice from California to Atlanta. And, and you know, we just uh, found that there was this wonderful uh, synergy between our work and, and that, that really, I love what you said, Jess, about that 
it helps people find that longer lasting kind of integration into their lives because I think ultimately that's what we really want is for them to find their pra their yoga practice as a place where they can um, try things, experiment, and and find a safe kind of refuge for the things that are kind of harder about pelvic PT mm -hmm. and and then integrate it into daily life. So I I love working with Jess because it's ultimately I think what both of us really want is for our students or clients to find ease in the body and then stay at ease mm -hmm. and be able to live that way. And so when when it complements itself so well, it's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I also think it's awesome that the yoga world specifically is getting a little bit of a clue about how much more nuanced and uh, integrated the pelvic floor is. It's not this thing sitting at the bottom of the pelvic. It's not a hammock. Um, <laughs> we're not going to make it. Yeah, we're not going to make it stronger by squeezing everything south of the belt loops and engaging in mula bandha 16 times in a row uh, in the middle of the day. Uh, but that the yoga world is getting much more of a clue about the integral part the pelvic floor plays in whole body health. So I'm going to just sit back for a minute and I would love for both of you to talk about the role of the pelvic floor in overall health. It's not just a hammock that everybody is just hanging off the bottom. Uh, so please have at it. Gosh, that is a huge question. Yeah. Huge in yeah. integral and in overall health. That's a big question. I mean, it's fundamental. It's absolutely fundamental to a well-functioning sense of self, I think. What would you say, Jeff? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think I think the it's interesting because as you were saying, the yoga community has started to realize that it's more than just the pelvic floor. And I think the same journey has happened from a physical therapy standpoint and how it's viewed. Because traditionally, if you look way back in terms of how people thought about pelvic floor well, say problems, but, you know, things like uh, when people are leaking, when they cough and sneeze and everything like that, it was all very pelvic floor focused where it mm -hmm. was like, okay, do Kegels and do like 50 of them a day. And, mm -hmm. you know, like you were just saying, and that's going to make you have a healthy pelvic floor. But what we've learned about the pelvic floor is that it's part of a system. It does not work in isolation and the pelvic floor uh, has been studied and has been shown to synergistically, neurologically coordinate with the respiratory diaphragm. Um, they work together um, in a pattern to where when a person inhales, the pelvic floor descends. When they mm -hmm. exhale, the pelvic floor, um, the diaphragm elevates and the pelvic floor elevates. And then that is partnered together with the deep abdominal muscles, with the deep low back muscles. And together, those muscles modulate pressure in the abdomen and the pelvis. They pre-activate when a person goes to do any type of movement. And then they actually modulate their force based on the task at hand. And I think that when people, and then, and so that's, you know, if we take one step back, but then we take another step back and we realize that that little system is also living in a body and that everything is interconnected from how, you know, how a person's rib cage is moving to what's happening at their vocal folds to what's their foot posture and, and everything is interconnected. Um, you know, when I teach courses, I always tell the new practitioners, um, I'll ask one of my trick questions that I'll always ask is I'll say, um, so if, so how strong does the pelvic floor need to be for someone to hold back urine? And people will give different answers. You know, we grade strength on a zero to five scale. So they'll say at least a four out of five or something like that. And I'll say, no, because incontinence is a system. So, you know, it's, it's not just about how strong is the pelvic floor. It's we, we need a strong, healthy, flexible, coordinated pelvic floor that is living within this healthy system of the body. And I know, Patty, we've had so many conversations just about this the the ecosystem if you will of the body and of how what is happening there and how that impacts the pelvic floor and i think this is where like jess and i are such teachers we're teaching all the time but i love your trick questions jess that's awesome <laughs> um 
because I will, you know, sometimes start pelvic floor workshops or pelvic floor, you know, study days, teacher training with work in the shoulders and, you know, kind of, it's just a little sneaky. It's sweet, sneaky. It's nice, sneaky, but like emphasizing that when we're in the shoulders, we're in the pelvic floor. When we're in the thoracic space, when we're in the rib basket, we're in the pelvic floor because actually the girdles of the body and the, the diaphragms of the body, you know, mirror one another. They should ideally work together. Sometimes they're a little bit at odds and this can be a clue. This can be one of the ways that we come towards mm, a desire for wellness or a, you know, acknowledging that things need to change a little bit is when we know that actually things are working suboptimally and not with each other. So, um, you know, I think that that's also one of the, to go back to your previous question, Lynn, about what, what is it that we do so well together um, PT and yoga, I think one of the things that, you know, people need to do when they go to pelvic PT is be in the pelvis. But one of the things that yoga can do is help them access the pelvis with different entry points, mm -hmm. like coming to the thoracic basket cup, coming to the shoulder girdle in a different way and finding the entry to pelvic wellness there. And that's especially relevant for people living with levels of trauma that mean that heading into the pelvis isn't the next right step. Or, um, you know, and we can imagine various other reasons why we might not go straight to the pelvis. Well, so. since it is so, so sort of all encompassing, or it's, I just keep coming back to the word holistic. Uh, and we know, you know, people are familiar with incontinence and maybe they're familiar with some sexual uh, dysfunction, but what would be some other unexpected um, symptoms or, or, or conditions that might have an element of pel pelvic floor imbalance in them? I, I could speak just um, in a yogic way for a minute that, mm -hmm. that especially, you know, one of the things Jess and I try to stress because we do work with, um, uh, uh, sometimes we work with new mom populations, mm -hmm. uh, is that you had a pelvic floor before your fertility journey. And so, you know, and a lot, for a lot of people, their fertility journey becomes the first place that they kind of let their pelvic floor come into awareness. Um, but of course we have a pelvic floor that we're born with that takes on our family of origin stuff that um, takes on our movement patterns and repetitive movements in our childhood. And so one of the, one of the things that I might see in a yoga population would be a torn labrum in the hip or unstable SI joints or destabilized SI joints. And especially now with a younger yogi population who may have come up where it's more common for children to do a lot of gymnastics or a lot mm -hmm. of dance um, and then go into a yoga practice. So I see, I see that as a, as a um, you know, it's, I mean, I, like not, not in a, again, not in a sneaky way, but when people come to me and say, well, I've just got this labral tear in my hip, but I don't think, you know, and I'm like, mm, let's think again about maybe that could be related to pelvic floor stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Jess, what do you think? <laughs> no, I completely agree. And I think that also there's, you know, when we think about the pelvic floor, like you said, a lot of people think about maybe some sexual dysfunction. They might think about incontinence. That's a really popular type of mm -hmm. dysfunction for the pelvic floor but the popular one. Um, popular. <laughs> yes. But, but, you know, um, the, there's, there's other, there are other functions of the pelvic floor as well that people often don't necessarily understand quite as much. So for example, um, bowel problems can be really interconnected with the pelvic floor. Constipation is the number one GI complaint in the country. And a large percentage of people dealing with constipation have difficulties at their outlet where the muscles are not opening well for defecation. And that leads to building up of stool, drier stool, more difficulty evacuating. So that's a big one. Um, uh, the sexual dysfunction as well. And then pain is really big. And it's not just genital pain. It can be genital pain, but it can be all sorts of pelvic pain conditions. And then going up into the SI joint and the low back as well. Uh, there was a study recently, I believe it was a year, maybe one to two years ago, that was looking at people with, with low back pain and found that 90% of them had pelvic floor dysfunction. And 70% uh, and of the people who had pelvic floor dysfunction actually had 
more challenges with overactivity in their pelvic floor. And that overactivity piece, I think is often a piece that people tend to miss a lot. People focus so much on trying to activate the pelvic floor. Yeah. And some people may have some weakness in their muscles that really need strengthening, but there's a whole different group. I would, and I would say a larger group of people that actually carry tension in their pelvic floor and really need to learn to let go of that and open around their pelvis, lengthen their pelvic floor. And, or we'll have a combination of some things going on with some coordination difficulties and with overactivity. And that can present in so many ways with some low back pain. I've treated some people who've had uh, really severe low back pain and they're not responding to typical treatment and the driver is related more to their pelvic floor. Um, but even, even up higher, really, even in, into the rib cage, we've seen mm -hmm. some ties in with things like reflux and other things related to the pelvic floor too. And I know, what do you think, Patty? Yeah, I totally agree. And, and I think like for, um, you know, the yoga community, you know, listening to this, we're thinking about the, a study like that, that's showing chronic low back pain. And, and I, I think I know the study you're referring to Jess, where they're really arguing for, um, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy as like a, a next right step, mm -hmm. at, um, when people are presenting with chronic low back pain. But I just think that, especially for yoga teachers, you know, among our listeners, you're going to hear that a lot when people come into your studio to practice or for the yoga therapist or, you know, it's one of the main reasons people go to yoga therapy is to relieve chronic low back pain. So, um, you know, having that as a, as a, uh, little, just, just to like flag, like, Oh, I should, I should ask a few more questions here. Or if I don't know how to do it, I should refer to someone who does know how to do it to consider the question of the pelvic floor piece and chronic low back pain. Cause that's that kind of generalized complaint that you're going to hear that, um, that, that can really be an indicator of, of, um, something that needs a little bit more attention. I think one of the misunderstandings or one of the reasons that people haven't found their way, I, it, it really warms my heart. Um, you know, when you go on all these yoga <laughs> social media things and people are saying uh, my pelvic floor and then someone will come in and prescribe Mula Bunda and Mula Bunda. someone else will finally come in and say, for, <laughs> for gosh sakes, go to a pelvic floor PT that the need for people to go to not just a PT, but a pelvic floor PT who really understands. And one of the things that I think has maybe uh, stopped that or, or, or hasn't occurred to people is that thing that I started with where I learned in my teacher training, I have since had hundreds and hundreds of hours of anatomy and done dissections and stuff. But in the beginning, I learned it's a hammock, it's a sling, it's just going from here to here. And it would never occur to me that something in my throat might be part of a pelvic floor. So what I'd love you to talk about a little bit, because it's not just, it is actually the physical connections between the pelvic floor and the rest of the body that are not so obvious. If you could just... Mm -hmm. Just yeah. do that in like a minute and a half. No, <laughs> I know. I'm just asking you this. Yeah. Very... You don't want me to get the illustrated coloring book out? Come on. <laughs> Should we look at the facts of that? Okay, so we don't have a lot of time, but we do have some time. So, <laughs> Jess, you go first. Well, you know, um, it was interesting as you were as you were mentioning the hammock. You know, another one we'll hear in Pete in the physical therapy world is they'll say the pelvic floor is a bowl in the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And Patty and I, I remember we were talking about this like several months ago about how those analogies are so helpful or so unhelpful because there are all these static structures, you know, where there's not a lot of, there's, I mean, now the hammock, you get a little bit of movement, but all it does is sag, right? Like that's, that's what a hammock does. And if you view your pelvic floor as a hammock, then all its job is to sag and to hold organs. And it doesn't do that. It's a much more dynamic thing. Um, there's a physiotherapist pelvic health out of the UK named Jilly Bond. And she said to me, and I told Patty this once um, that she said, I think the pelvic floor is more like a tongue. And I'm like, that disturbs me. <laughs> I know, but 
well, the amazing thing is if you think about the tongue as being this muscular structure that really can move in a lot of ah. different directions and do yeah. things and adjust yeah. and, you know, impact different sounds for us and all this stuff, the pelvic floor in a lot of ways is so intricately functional in very different ways, you know, to where it is involved in reflexes for our bowels and for our bladder that are very unique to where it is able to, through its contractions, through relaxation, impact um, the rectal sensation. It's, you know, it's impacting what's happening with the bladder in a very unique way. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mentioned previously this synergistic relationship from the pelvic floor to the respiratory diaphragm. Mm -hmm. But if we go a level higher, the respiratory diaphragm is very interconnected with the glottal folds. And so because all of these structures work together synergistically, problems that we see in one area can impact everything in the rest of the chain. So for example, um, if someone has, um, you know, a, a surgery at their abdominal wall and they develop scar tissue in their abdominal wall where their abdominal muscles can't function as well, that's going to impact what's happening right at the belly. However, it also may make it so they cannot take as deep of a breath. And their diaphragm can't descend as well. And if the diaphragm can't descend as well, the pelvic floor is not going to move as well. So they might develop some overactivity. And then their deep low back muscles won't be able to fire as well. And they might develop some back pain because of how they're moving. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can start seeing that as we go up the whole chain. And now that's, that's just one piece just in terms of the functional connections. Um, but above all these muscles, we also have fascia and connective tissue that is very involved and, and chains of fascia to where what's happening in one zone is fascially connected to the other. And that's where, you know, seeing the body less of parts and more as these different gears, these different structures that are all just part of this really well-functioning system, I think helps us view these pieces um, a little bit better. Yeah. And I, I really want to, yes, all of that for sure done just did it but also i want to like um give a different example something like abdominal surgery makes sense to us adhesion makes sense to us something also like scoliosis where we see um you know a kind of rotation through the rib basket uh you know it, it's very common that i see students that i refer to a, a specialist PT in scoliosis who also need to see a pelvic PT and then take some yoga with me because what's happening in the rotation in the rib basket is having an effect on what's happening in the pelvic floor. And, and there's, you know, especially for people whose scoliosis has gone um, uncared for or, and, or whose movement has contributed to, um, you know, rotational patterns that are unhelpful or restrictive, um, you know, their pelvic floor is gonna express that. I think that's, you know, I had a student yesterday say, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And I think we just wanna think about the expressions in the body and then take a, a very, Lynn, to use your word, a very holistic approach and find the correct pathways of care, the referrals for people who really know, you know, what they're doing. Jess, you said something else about, oh, about seeing it as, um, gears or, and I, I also think, especially because I think a lot about fascia and connective tissue, I know you do too, Jeff, uh, I think about it as like messaging networks. So we have these great highways of fascia that we know are, you know, conductive, you know, that, 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 and, and so really kind of thinking it again, not in isolation, but as part of these messaging highways, you know, these large diagonal swaths, these uh, more linearly oriented, uh, you know, bands of connective tissue. They're really, I love to think about when we restore our system to really optimally functioning that these messaging systems are just like, like fluid, almost like it's like a Pixar animation or something. And they're just like fluid and they light up and, and the messaging is so clear. It's very soft. Beautiful. Very, and, and, and so you want to keep the channel uh, clear, clear and open. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure who I'm asking this question of, but um, I think I'm asking Patty. <laughs> we'll, we'll see who I'm asking. Yes, we'll see. Um, what I wanted to ask, you mentioned sphincter. 
And we know there's three sphincters in the body, right? Three main sphincters, and they kind of correspond to the bandhas. Is there okay. a relationship between the, the anal sphincter and the other two? You mentioned the glottis, so that made me wonder about the uh, Uddiyana area. Yeah, so I actually think probably the way Jess describes sphincters and the way that we think about bunda levels is pretty different. So Jess is going to describe like a urethral sphincter. Mm, uh, Jess, do you want right. to talk about the way you think about sphincters? Oh, you go first. You you talk talk through what you're thinking. Well, I'm not really sure about well, when why don't, let's, question. Let's I don't simplify. Think yeah, just talk about yeah. bandas. And how, and... and how you use them, if you use them, Patty. So there's oh, yes. Mula, okay. Jalandara, and then there's, of course, Uddiyana. Uddiyana Vanda, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think this is interesting. So just, just to think about it, like the, the, the way that people think about Uddiyana Vanda is, is complicated. And I think it depends on who your teacher is and, and the kind of tradition you've learned. Um, whether you're going to then give an like a kind of blanket statement of pull your navel to your spine. Um, is that okay? Is that I said, <laughs> I know it's not my favorite cue. Um, it's not my favorite cue. And, and just, we might think about that as something that like creates a kind of downward pressure with unmet load and, and you know, that we, so really when I think about those two lower bandhas, Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha, I'm really, thinking about waiting for the pause, waiting for empty, waiting for the pause, and, um, and then trying to find almost like a, 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 a drawing in and up that I think ultimately, and, and ultimately I hope that it takes us to the, the connection to the spine, that thoracal lumbar joint um, or thoracal lumbar Space, as we find that kind of involution, that turning in on ourselves. But I do think it comes, and I'm reminded that some of the old ways is to teach Uddiyana Bandha first and have that actually be the way that we feel the lift of Mula Bandha. And this is actually a really lovely synergy with the PT trying to teach about modulated effort, that actually it's not about a clenching in Mula Bandha, that if you can find the pause, the empty, drawing, scooping Uddiyana Bandha in and up, you may well feel a lifting of Mula Bandha that is a modulated effort. And I think anybody who's, you know, in their yoga practice lifting body weight or taking load into the body knows that we want to, I was lucky because I think I learned Mula Bandha as a modulated effort from a number of my teachers. And then also that maybe one of the best ways to find it is to take Uddiyana Bandha first. So is that, I don't know, Lynn, that's such yeah, a hard yeah, question. Yeah, I think it is, you're right, it's a complicated um, question, and I think you did a great job. So oh, well, thank you. Can we just <laughs> go back, though, to how you work uh, with the breath? I oh, know yeah. you both probably work with the breath. Is it similar? Is it the same? Is it, how do you think about the breath when you're yeah. working with the pelvic floor? I, I mean, I think that the breath is crucial to the pelvic floor, um, and it, we teach it in all of in all of the coursework. When I'm teaching rehab professionals to to assess the pelvic floor, you you can't separate what's happening with the breath, and um, just because of that synergistic relationship with um, with the diaphragm. So mm -hmm. I I usually assess it when patients first come in and look to see what their natural breathing pattern is. Uh, ideally, when when someone is getting diaphragmatic excursion, we you know previously diaphragmatic breathing was taught often as belly breathing, and so it was taught to breathe into the belly. And you know a classic exercise that they would teach people would be you know put your hand on your chest and your hand on your belly and take your breath into your belly. And that cue can work for someone who cannot take their breath and expand into their abdomen. Um, but really with diaphragmatic excursion, we want to have um, a 
three-part movement. And so we want to have the belly lift, but we also want the rib cage to expand and the chest to lift. And we want all three parts to be happening. And so that's what we often will look for with assessing the breath is to see, is someone able to move within these three parts? And, and if we see that there's areas that may not move well, then we, we can tailor things to try to cue them with that. And then to ultimately learn how to use their breath to facilitate what we're wanting to optimize for them for their pelvic floor health, which for some people who may live in a state of overactivity, it's often helping them learn how to really inhale and allow their breath to allow the pelvic floor to actually descend and drop. And, and it's interesting because so much effort goes into cueing people to contract their pelvic floor, but it is 50,000 times harder to teach a person to relax their pelvic floor. And don't you agree? Abby? I mean, I do. You have like all these cues, you know, you lift the marble and you, you know, I mean, I suck the straw, suck the straw, Pick up the blueberry. Yes. All sorts <laughs> of, you know, even some slightly weird ones. But, it's kind of gross. The smoothie one is gross. Oh, that's because yes, you're my that's your analogy. <laughs> Think about pulling the turtle into it's a really shell. <laughs> Sorry, Lynn. This is what I do. My my poor patients. I'm like, all right, bear with me. Bear with me. We got this. Think about this turtle. But but relaxing and actually being able to let go. And I have to in my practice. I don't often even try to use the term relax because if someone tells you relax, you're like, how dare you? You know. Don't tell I mean, me to relax. Yeah, like we get a little resistant to it. So I, I try to instead encourage them to try to find some space, to try to lengthen, to see if they can allow their breath to move deeper into the pelvis and pay attention to where their breath is stopping. Because many times they'll feel this stop that their their body's not allowing the breath to descend. And so, you know, we work with that. And then, and then if someone really needs to retrain activation of the muscles, I often initially teach that pairing it with their breath. Um, to teach them how to contract with their exhalation to really try to get that synergistic motion. And that modulation that you were talking about, Patty, is so important because so many people think of the pelvic floor as this all or nothing thing. Yes, you're either right. maximally contracted or you're completely relaxed. But mm -hmm. the reality is that you know, when you go to lift a box full of books, you don't use the same force that you would use if you were lifting a box full of feathers. And the same is true for the pelvic floor that it has different tasks and it should be able to modulate its activity based on the task at hand. So that's, that's where I go with the breath, but I, I don't know, Patty, if you want to talk a little bit about where you go with that in terms of the yoga practice. I think we go the same place, but I think that like, I just, I, and I don't need to repeat what you said. I think that, you know, there's different ways. So um, I love Julie Weeb's um, yes. uh, work about, you know, sometimes we do really want to wait right for the bottom of the exhalation for that pause, especially for people who need to retrain that, that collection of the pelvic floor, who need to retrain the, um, the, the kind of impulse where it's not no longer reflexive. They really have to think about it. You know, I think sometimes, uh, and, and Jill Miller has some really nice work about waiting to kind of understand at what part of the exhalation, Jill Miller's a, a, a yogi, mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, just about, you know, where do we engage? Where do we pick up and, and, and really judging it according to that, uh, modulation of effort and how much how much kind of work we need to ask the pelvic floor to do but the other thing I was going to say about um, I, I love I, I think what yoga can offer and this question of the imagery also is that um, I, I love what you said just about that three-part breath but then also what I know you and I both see in our students and our clients is that there's portions of their diaphragms that are kind of where the breath is inaccessible. Like we might, they might use the word like blocked or shut down or they just, and we can see it in their breath. And especially like, I love Jess, Jess is such a yogi that she observes the breath first. And I, this is what I also do with my students is really just watching to see where that breath is available in the body and where it is not yet or not at this moment available. But the side ribs and the back ribs are a place that we really see a lack of avail availability or accessibility of the breath. And so working with imagery like 
um, I've, I'm teaching a workshop right now where I'm thinking about like the children's parachute where we have the little the little man and the strings and we notice like it it's full all the way. We all kind of know intuitively that part of that parachute shouldn't really be inaccessible. It shouldn't be collapsed. We want it to be a nice kind of fluffy white little cloud with a little mm-hmm. you know person coming down or a jellyfish that they don't inflate for the lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. Um, part of themselves, that they're, you know, expansive in the back body, in the side bodies. And so I think that's one of the things that yoga can do is to help bring the breath into the full book because pelvic floors are shut down in the backside in particular, you know, it's, and it's a really hard place for people to get to, to get the breath to, to get relaxation to, which is the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's something yoga can do. That's something I do when I, when I work with my students is help them to get a full bodied sense of their breath so that they can inhabit their whole pelvic floor. You know, um, Patty, sorry, just one little, one yeah, little as, you were, as you were talking, I was thinking, so you mentioned Julie Weeb and, and Julie Weeb, I, I give her a lot of credit because she's, she has been, she's a physical therapist out of, out in California and she teaches a lot of coursework on really on viewing the pelvic floor within the body and her and has developed so many concepts for that I think have been foundational for so many clinicians and and many other people about how the pelvic floor fits within the body but one thing that she an example that she uses for the breath is she she talks about um, an umbrella breath and so she gives people the cue of this umbrella that's opening in 360 degrees. Nice. And that that's really what we want with diaphragmatic excursion is this breath that's opening on all sides and not nice. just in one particular part. I love all of your analogies to Patty, but that just it came to mind as you were sharing that. Well, and that's what's perfect about things like the parachute or the umbrella is that we yeah. kind of intuitively know that we don't want only a portion of it yes. to work. You know, and it helps people understand the connections in at the back of the spine mm-hmm. and and that they may then be and that gets us back to the question of Udiana Bunda and there we go, it all comes yeah. back. So it <laughs> turns out to have been a good question. <laughs> Hard, but good. <laughs> um, but what you're describing is a really uh, in the, uh, I actually said it at the beginning, a subtle and a nuanced view of the body of the whole body, including the pelvic floor. And it sounds like um, cueing and language and imagery are all really important to understand how to guide, say, a yoga student. Because when you come into a group yoga class, you don't know who's got a pelvic floor issue. You probably could guess that a lot of people do. but if you careful, carefully cue for the whole group, then everyone's pelvic floor is going to benefit by a healthy, beautifully cued practice. Correct? Correct. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, so- yeah. <laughs> I obviously could ask you questions for six more hours. Um, luckily, you're going to teach a two-part course for us that is six hours. Um, So (laughs) can you tell us a little bit what's going to be in that course? So it's going to be four lectures and two practices. Um, So can you talk a little bit about what you're going to cover? Obviously, maybe some of what we've covered here, but uh, what else will be happening in those lectures? Yeah, we're very excited about it. Um, you know, we, I, I think that it's it's a really unique offering that we have because it's super collaborative and coming at it from the sides of, you know, with my perspective as a pelvic physical therapist and then Patty's extensive experience as a yoga teacher and um, and pelvic specialist, it, um, it I think it, it created this really nice blend. And so, you know, we're, we have kind of two over two categories that we're talking about. The first, the first two um, lecture type uh, sections are more introducing 
the the pelvic floor and um, and how the pelvic floor fits within the body. Um, what are the some of the common challenges that people can have in the pelvic floor, um, and and that's and that's kind of where I'm talking. And then Patty then is going more into how the pelvic the pelvic floor is fitting within the body from more of a yogic standpoint mm -hmm. and um and then and i'm going to let patty share a lot more about where we're going with the practices um but then the second portion the two lectures are really focused more on overactivity and mm. um and the nervous system and and how quieting the nervous system can be a, a really just important piece and understanding how to to really find space within the pelvis. And um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of overarching. But uh, Patty, I'm gonna let you talk a little bit more about some of those pieces too. No, I mean, I think Jess summed it up perfectly in the, the, so you have this first offering that we wanted to really highlight and emphasize the basics of what, you know, you've just asked us questions about Lynn and we get Jessica's wonderful expertise about the role of the pelvic floor and its relationship to the rest of the body. And then I, I'm kind of bringing in a perspective on the yoga piece that isn't just muscular. So it gets right back to your question around, so it's, it's just the pelvic floor, right? Well, not really. And so also it's not just, can we think of asana that targets the pelvic floor? Because that's an important piece and it's not that we're ignoring it, but it's not the only yogic way to come to pelvic floor health and to see the pelvic floor as part of a global system, because ultimately that is a well-functioning pelvic floor is when it's operating as a system. So the two practices, we actually offered two short practices as part of that, that first offering on the pelvic floor within a global system and the foundations of it. And one of them is um, a way to just create that kind of lovely, fluid, sense in the body. It's, it's a really accessible practice. It just uses two blocks. And, um, you know, we, that was something that Jess and I felt really strongly about that these practices are accessible and easily adaptable for what people have at home and mm -hmm. how their bodies are, et cetera. And then the, the second practice in there is not targeted at the pelvic floor in terms of this asana will do this kegel. It's asking it's asking for you to use your pelvic floor as the very base of your true core. And then it's ask, it's a strengthening practice. It's, it's more active. That sounds awesome. And then in our, sorry. It sounds second, awesome. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. You can rate it later out of five. <laughs> the, um, the second practice, because this is something that, you know, it's really challenging. When, when Jess and I were asked to talk about overactivity, Jess and I both know that there is no way for us to give a 60 minute yoga practice that's going to deal with everybody's overactivity. There's just no way to do that. And there's no way to do that safely and sensitively and in a way that would, you know, really reflect what we know to be true from our students and our, our population. And so what we came to is that what we want to gift, what we want to give and offer is, is that most people need a couple different things. And so we offered these three short practices um, that would benefit anybody. And you could take them to your care provider and say, I don't really do this one very well, but can we think of something else that meets this need? Mm -hmm. So one of the practices we offer really deals with connective tissue and fluidity, that kind of, those kind of messaging systems in the body. One of them is just very still. It's about space and breath and pelvic reset, and it's actually about good biomechanics. Can we use what we know about how to create space in the pelvis, dropping femurs into hip sockets, alignment into the pelvis? Can we use that to make, it's like a Montessori classroom, can we prepare the environment? And then, and then the other is about creating elasticity in the muscles of the pelvic floor. Well, it yeah. does sound awesome. I'm looking forward to tuning in. And thank you both so much. This has been really fascinating. And uh, I think uh, I speak for a lot of people when I say I, I'm interested to hear more. So I'm excited for your gores. Awesome. Uh, thank you. So thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. 
Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.